thousand the uh, members across all different creative industries, which is um, both um, exciting and quite challenging in a good way. Um, we have uh, very proudly joined the Green Arts Initiative um, earlier this year, and as our pledge, we are trying our very best to introduce the the topic of sustainable creativity and circular production to everything that we do um, and we do a number of different things um, including um, events and so in in september we um, hosted future gaze um, which was um, dedicated to the future of sustainable creativity some of you may have attended that we also had um, our monthly creative circles networking event which um, was focused on sustainability and we had guests from Lauriston Farm and also National Galleries of Scotland who are um, setting up a, a new um, storage facility at Granton which will be a passive house facility so it was really fascinating to hear about those those projects we have recently introduced um, a dedicated um, sustainability uh, related section in our monthly newsletter in order to be able to flag up important projects which our members are involved in and um, we also have just drafted our first ever sustainability policy which we're going to launch on our new website in November and we're working with one of our strategic subgroups on a sustainability action plan which will be comprehensive and it will include a lot of information for our members but also for for our staff uh, so we're trying to do everything that we can to ensure that sustainability is part of, of our operations but also our programming and if you would like to know more and if you'd like to specifically learn about those um, initiatives please send us an email and we'll add you to a dedicated mailing list for for that and um, one other thing to add is that we have done some research um this year specifically on what creative freelancers in edinburgh have experienced over the last two years due to pandemic brexit climate emergency and we have recently published um, a report with some really fascinating findings and i just wanted to share with you three top line um things from that report which are relevant to to our session um our event to today um we asked um people who have participated in in the survey and, and focus groups um um as part of that research to what extent freelancers felt ready for net zero economy and this, the results um showed that about one fourth one quarter felt somewhere in the middle so on the scale of 10 they they felt around five so this is this is the readiness of creative freelancers in edinburgh for uh, for net zero um 12 percent felt fully ready i'd love to meet them i don't know who they are but i'd really like to learn more and 84 percent said that they wanted to attend training or events or um, they wanted resources in order to be able to educate themselves which is really important and encouraging and we're trying to respond to that through events like like this so what we've got today is called roundtable um it used to be called talking heads um, and essentially it is a chance to bring um people together in one space around freelance table to discuss challenges faced by creatives and and offer a chance to to share thoughts ideas and and recommendations and um and I really hope that you uh, enjoy this afternoon and that you do make valuable um, connections and, and learn loads. And I am delighted that we're working in collaboration with Creative Carbon Scotland um, and that we have some brilliant panelists who are going to be um, introduced in, in one second. So um, without um, further ado, I would like to introduce Louis um, Conroe, who will say whom he is and who will um, chair the panel. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Ola. Yes, I'm Lewis. I work at Creative Carbon Scotland, which is a charity working on the roles of arts and culture in addressing climate change. That involves a wide range of things. So we look at how the arts and culture sector can reduce or improve our own environmental impact. And that includes things like the Green Arts Initiative that Ola referenced. So uh, bringing together a network of over 300 arts and cultural organisations working on uh, reducing their carbon emissions and improving their environmental impact. 
it also involves thinking about the broader influencing role of arts and culture so thinking about creative work that engages with climate change in a meaningful way and also thinking about how those working in the arts and cultural sectors working in the creative industries can collaborate with people working on climate change so researchers campaigners community groups government agencies and trying to promote more of that cross fertilization than than we're seeing at the moment so i think those are sort of the three key things that we're probably going to be looking at throughout this session so uh improving our own environmental impacts thinking about artistic work and creative work that engages with climate change and that issue of collaboration so i think those are things we'll be coming back to um we're going to have space in the second half of this for group discussions which will be focused on those themes but before that we have our fantastic panelists who are very pleased to have with us today so the way things are going to work i'm going to introduce the three panelists they're both they're all three of them going to uh give a quick presentation talking about their work uh there'll be a few questions from me uh to kind of try and highlight some shared themes across the the three of what they do because i think it's they all come from quite different perspectives which is great and then we will have space for questions from people in the room and people who are joining online um for those questions uh, if you want to, if you're in the room, you can raise your hand and I'll bring you in and you'll, uh, you can just shout out your question. I will then repeat the question so that the people online can hear it, um, which sounds a bit weird, but um, helps everyone to know what's going on. Um, if you're joining online, you can pass on those questions to Zoe, who will pass them on to me to then give to the panel. So hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, I'm now going to introduce our three fantastic panelists. So uh going from going across we have lucy power lucy is the artistic director and senior environmental consultant for rowan bank environmental arts and education lucy is lead artist and environmental consultant for rowan bank's creative climate education program positive imaginings lucy has a first class degree in ecological science from the university of edinburgh is a qualified forest school leader and in eco homes and bream building research establishment environmental assessment method assessor lucy is also an aerial performer and teacher for rowan bank all or nothing aerial dance theater and dance base scotland's national center for dance we also have irina who we're very glad who has stepped in at the very last minute to replace claire who was is unfortunately ill with covid so special thanks for Irina for stepping in uh irina zanoyeva makes images writes walks organizes and performs originally from the middle of the ukrainian step Arena now lives by the North Sea coast in Scotland. Here she works with the sustainability organization Sniffer on transforming organizations and places to flourish in the future climate. This involves leading climate change adaptation projects, researching the role of creative practice in eco social transformations, and creating structures for collaborative, careful, and non hierarchical decision making. In her independent practice, Arena explores multi species relations from pigs and viruses to nature's to walking and steps and eco feminism. In her recent work, she dreams to see the step again with Dr. Daria Simbaluk and imagines a dog opera with Dr. Kit Braybrook and interested to hear more about that. And finally, we have uh, at the end of the row, Jeske Gaitan Johannesson. Uh, Jess is a Swedish Colombian writer and climate justice activist based in Edinburgh, whose work focuses on the multiplicity of identity and belonging. Her debut novel, How We Are Translated, was long listed for the Desmond Elliott Prize, and her essay, The Co Collection, The Nerves and Their Endings, Essays on Crisis and Response, is published in August 2022. She was Wasafiri Magazine's Writers in Residence for 2021 to 22, delivering workshops on writing and climate justice. She works as Digital Campaigns Manager for Lighthouse Books, Edinburgh's Radical Bookshop, and organises with Climate Camp Scotland, among other groups. So. Without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Lucy, the first of our panelists. Hi, I'm Lucy, and I work for Rowan Bank Environmental Arts and Education. So we're an organisation that's based in Edinburgh, but we work throughout Scotland and the rest of the UK. And we do lots of different things, but um, one of the things that I suppose I feel most passionately about is our outdoor performances. So we do promenade performances mainly through forests, mainly for children, but not only for children. Um, 
So actually, I just cycled here from the forest where I've been performing all day. <laughs> so if I look a bit like rosy cheeked, it's because I've just come in from the woods and quickly run to the bathroom and wash the face paint off my face. Mm -hmm. um, and the show that I was performing today is called Positive Imaginings. And it's our climate, um, creative climate education project. And at the moment, we're working with Edinburgh Primary Schools and we're touring the woodlands of Edinburgh, the urban woodlands of Edinburgh, and inviting primary schools to take part and it's a show that looks at the climate crisis through a different lens it's all about changing your perspective in terms of um, how you can take action to help prevent climate change and it's about empowering children that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have a voice it was developed in the run-up to COP26 so la this time last year it was being developed in collaboration with the children from um, Craig Miller from Castleview Primary School so we worked with the children for a series of six weeks in the forest and gathered their ideas of what they felt was important to them in terms of tackling the climate crisis and also the biodiversity crisis, because I think the two are interlinked and can't be separated. And um, the show was then developed by theatre makers and environmental educators, and it's evolved and now it's yeah visiting lots of different primary schools. So the idea with the show is that you shouldn't or you yeah you can't really compartmentalize climate education and um, we work also with businesses actually and we say the same there shouldn't be a climate department that or a sustainability department it actually needs to be in everything that we do and I think that's the kind of change of perspective we're trying to inspire and I think the arts is a really amazing way to kind of quite efficiently get to the heart of something um so it's about climate education and nature education being part of everything that a school does with its learners or everything that a business does and all the every decision that's made. And um, we have adopted a, I suppose it's a philosophy called the children's fire. And it's a, it's a Native American um, wisdom, I suppose. And it, it, it says that no decision should be made without considering the needs of the current generation of children and seven generations to come and by children it means the children of all living things and it's a really beautiful philosophy and we try and encourage the people we try and encourage ourselves and the people we work with to adopt that approach um, so we combine aerial skills and music and theater and storytelling to weave these ideas into a show um, so you're welcome to get in touch and come and see one of our shows if you'd like it's all online but I wanted to um play you a little it's a one minute soundscape and when we were working with these children in Craig Miller last year we asked them where they wanted their voices to be heard in the run-up to COP26 and they went at COP26 and we went uh-oh <laughs> how are we going to do that when all the world leaders are there very busy so we decided that if we could make something that was one minute long everybody has one minute so we went on a one minute campaign to see who had a minute to listen to the children of Craig Miller and what their ideas were for the future of our planet. Um, and we managed to get it played at COP26. RSPB took it on as part of their Glasgow to Globe um, campaign. It got played on the radio a lot um, and it got played on national radio as well as local radio, but it also got picked up by, which was my kind of biggest pride, I think, there's a climate podcast called Outrage and Optimism. I don't know if anyone listens to it, but if you don't, you should. It's very good. It's the most listened to climate podcast in the world. It has 100,000 listeners and they played it. So these children in Craig Miller, who felt like nobody wanted to hear what they had to say, were suddenly listened to by people all over the world, um, including the world leaders. So, um, yeah. Are you happy to talk? Yeah. We're not asking the world leaders, we're telling them to like stop climate change. I would like for people to be using more cleaner energy and I would like the world to be more green and healthy. Clear streets with without any rubbish and all. I would try to help the animals in their habitats. Lots of birds hanging about and letting some extinct animals come in back. A robot that picks up litter and then recycles it right only on the road. And you have to do things too like protect 
which is where we showed our energy and the wrong energy. So I'm energy water energy. Being energy and it won't have much plastic, it will all be solar powered. But that's my planet Earth. That's what I want it to be. Um Uh, it's called Outrage and Optimism. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is the Positive Imaginings page of, of our website. So you can see the show. Um, it's just a two-minute little trailer. And, but then you can also see a nine-minute documentary. Um, so it's like a mini documentary that shows the making of the show and how it came about. Um, the other shows that we do are very much based on a celebration of the seasons. And as well as adopting the children's fire philosophy, we work on the basis of something called the natural flight of steps. So in my forest school training, I was very lucky to um, do a, a, a short course on the Swedish approach to forest school. And they talked about the natural flight of steps when talking about environmental education and how people learn and take action. And if a child or a person is walking up a short flight of steps, just four steps, the first step is um, enjoying nature. And the second step is observing nature. So maybe, you know, the leaves changing color or the creatures that live in a forest. And the third step is taking care of nature. And then the fourth step is perhaps campaigning, you know, to, to take care of nature and um, taking climate action. And so often we expect children to be on that third step to take care of nature, to take care of the environment without having spent any time on the first two steps of just enjoying it and observing it. So a lot of our work is about bringing people that otherwise perhaps wouldn't engage with the natural environment that we're part of, and we've just forgotten that, and just spending time in it and enjoying it. So a lot of joy, and it's kind of almost contradictory, isn't it, that you can have a joyful thing when talking about climate change because it's a devastating subject. Um, but I think it's actually really important to balance the devastating news and be true to that. And as a person who, you know, my background is in environmental science, I very much believe in the science and that it's very important to tell the truth, but it has to be age appropriate and it has to be balanced with the solutions um, and enabling children to feel that they've got um, agency and that they can be part of a collective solution and moving away from this individual action to collective because you can't make very much difference as an individual, but collectively we can. So that's part of the perspective change as well. Um, so I hope that kind of gives a very, it's a very quick overview of, of what we do. Um, but at the moment we're doing a run with schools, but we have to go back to the drawing board and try and secure funding because we're heavily subsidizing it to schools because the idea is that it's affordable for everybody. Um, we also are looking for collaborations um, with people that are taking climate action, organizations that are taking climate action within Edinburgh so we can link schools up with projects on the ground that they can take part in. So if you've got a project that you think that a bunch of 10 to 11 year old children can take part in and that they can feel is meaningful, then that would be amazing. And um, we're in this for the long haul. So I really believe in um, something that is called restorative culture when approaching the climate crisis. So it's urgent, we're in an emergency. But I think we need to look after ourselves because if we burn out on a burning planet, we really are doomed. So that's also where the nature connection comes in because it's very healing and it calms your senses. And it, I think it gives you that clarity of, okay, where's my place in this and how can we work together? So come and visit us in the forest. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, just to note, yeah, if, if questions are coming up for you off the back of the thing the speakers are saying, then do just keep a note of them mentally or uh, write them down and there will be space to share those questions a bit later on. Let's go now to Irina. Yes, I'm just going to talk a bit longer <laughs> to break the time. <laughs> um, yes, so we're very pleased to have Irina with us. Um, Claire Haggett sends her regards. She is very unwell with COVID, um, but you may still want to check out her work. She's a very interesting researcher who looks at renewable energy and involving people democratically in choices about energy systems and has worked a lot with creatives and with creative approaches as part of that. So although she's not able to be here today, um, do check out her work because it is really interesting stuff. Um, 
we're very pleased to have Irina with us, who is able to speak, I think, from a similar perspective, talking about uh, work on climate change and climate justice um, that involves a high degree of collaboration with uh, creatives and creative approaches. So I think it should be a really interesting, interesting perspective to hear from. Do I need to stand here to change? To change the slides? You probably you want me to yeah. change them for you. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, yeah. It's okay. okay, great. Is that okay? Great. Sorry, this feels like very, very formal. This is not intended to be this way. And could we maybe get these turn the slides off a little bit? Because I think it's a bit difficult to see the screen. Yeah, online won't be able to see you on social media. Okay. So sorry. Yeah. Well, sorry for those of you in the back. Uh, I'll be speaking mostly to everything that's on the slide, so don't worry about this. Um yeah. Hi everyone, and thanks, Lewis, for the introduction. And I've yeah, jumped into this very last moment and in deciding whether it makes sense to talk about like I'm involved in a lot of different things as an artist as someone who works at the environmental organization and I thought maybe it would be most interesting if I share something that merges all of the art and my multi-species climate work which is this project called Creatures that I'm working with um, and it's an abbreviation for creative practices for transformational futures and the organization that I'm working for here in Edinburgh is called Sniffer. Uh, we are one of the 12 consortium partners in this EU project. Um, this is just formal stuff. You don't really need to know this. Just it's, But it's a fundamental, I guess, the main takeaway from this slide. It's a research project. And we spent past three years looking at the role that creative practices defined very, very broadly, as in like art, design, music, making all sorts of creative work. Also, research as creative practice, I suppose. How does that contribute to change in the direction of more ecologically, more socially, more climate-wise just worlds. Um, this is just a constellation of partners of who is involved in the project. So it's kind of, it's a big project with 12 different organizations where we have uh, a few research uh, organizations, so a few universities involved. Then there's a few creative partner organizations that are doing the creative work. And there's a few organizations like my own that are kind of bridging the worlds of policy and practice uh, and activism and trying to communicate what we do to the worlds that are outside of academia and creative practice. Um, I will, yeah, I will skip this one maybe. And to say that kind of the core element of the project has been something that we refer to as laboratory, where we have commissioned uh, 26 different experimental productions of very different scales. So from a very small kind of growing, uh, your own micro microbiont kind of uh, work to a large scale participatory works. And what we've done in this past three years, which was very affected by COVID, couldn't do it in a way that we were all planning to do. We spend uh, yeah, a lot of time and attention alongside these 26 works in trying to understand, okay, what each, the, the, the commonality within all of them is that they're looking at the world in some ways and they're like okay a lot of things are broken a lot of things need to be fixed a lot of things need to be repaired and how do we do that um they have very different strategies and ways of going about that and we try to understand okay so how are they trying to do that so i will um give you an example of one of these experimental productions just to give you a sense of what what that is um yeah of what we did and what that means so for, for thinking about how creative practices are trying to move us towards more uh, more of the social and ecological sustainability. So it's the project called the Treaty of Finsbury Park 2025. <laughs> and I'm very sad that I couldn't take part in it in person. It was taking place in London. So it's an actual place uh, that's called Finsbury Park. And the organization that has been running this project for a few years now um, is called Further Field. And they've been working with uh, both people and other inhabitants of this park to think about the future of this place from a multi-species well-being and multi-species flourishing perspectives. Um, the core kind of the way that they are running this project is very much based around the idea of LARP, uh, so live action role play that happened both online and in person. So that's where the Zoom 
icon there with lots of people having fun masks of bees and squirrels and grass and trees and all sorts of creatures there um where yeah so these are the people who live in the area and that invested into the future of the area came to this uh, uh, interspecies assembly as a space where they had themselves as a human species and a companion species uh, to think about what does it mean to live well together in this park. So it kind of brings together this notion of collective decision making, people's assemblies that have been trialed and run with various success across the UK and, and taking that to the next level and thinking, okay, what does this mean if we're actually trying to think not from the human perspective, but include all these other worlds? into um into the story uh what they are doing also is uh, it's a very interesting playing with the conventional decision making processes because they are in touch with the london uh city authorities and the park department so the people that operate very much in the terms of uh, natural resource management or ecosystem services or those things and they kind of they don't operate within those words because that's a very particular policy speak framing for thinking about our relationship with nature or environment and they're kind of working with those and trying to weird those slightly and make things strange in a way that alters the perception of what is normal what is acceptable how can you make decisions together so kind of it's very much about trying to create the different institutions and different processes about making collective decisions together um and what we at, what we're trying to do at a different level in the project is to understand okay we're looking at examples like the treaty project and lots of others that are trying to do similar work uh, what are these different ways to think about these and ways to categorize them and currently this is not exactly the final version so please treat this as a as a draft and happy to you know have more conversations about this but we've been discussing something uh, that we call like dimensions of change or evaluation dimensions. So ways of thinking, okay, you look at the creative practice from someone who wants to commission a work that does something towards social or climate justice. What are the different things you have to consider? And the starting point is that often, and I'm sure it's, I think you have, will be familiar to many of you here, the role of creative practice often is communicated through Creative practices are important because they help us tell the science story or these kind of narratives that simplify it into something that can be only a vehicle for communicating some something else. And this was our attempt to say, okay, there's much bigger, broader things that are going on here. And it's really important to see that diversity. So for example, the bottom right corner, the disrupting and subverting one, that is a very important dimension of change, right? With that kind of the disruption and subversion that that can bring and open up different ways of being, different ways of relating, different ways of organizing is, is very key. Um, there is much more to each of those. I won't go into detail, but that's just, yeah, a way to kind of try to categorize uh, the different different ways creative practices engage with change. Um, and yeah, just finally, one notion that I thought I would share from this work is something that we refer to as creaturely, which is just a term, a concept, a way of doing, feeling, being, thinking that emerged in the project um, and it's you know this kind of when you're working um at these kind of very large complicated projects with a lot of people involved lots of creative practitioners involved um there is often these things that are that kind of this ephemeral almost but very very important to what we are trying to do and we ended up trying to talk about that as creaturely as a very particular way of uh, i'm just going to read this um this quote here that uh, unlike one of the uh, professors in the project has put uh, together. We are embodied, situated, feeling, thinking, sentiments are aware of the deeper layers of meaning, relation, eco-social, more than human, with a sense of the paradox of connectedness and separatedness of being alive and care for the plurality of experience. Um, so it's just a bit of an abstract notion to close on as a way of being and working with one another that emerged for us in this three years of working that we all felt was very significant and are trying to bring in all of the ways that we're working with one another outside of creatures as well. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Irina. Um... Zoe, can you reattach the other PowerPoints? Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we're now going to go to our third speaker, Jess. I'll just pass this along. Um, thank you. This is so fascinating um, and great. Uh, I, like Arena, um, I've got a lot of hats. <laughs> okay. uh, so I just sort of was trying to think what could be you know, most relevant to the discussion here today. And uh, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in my own writing is the way that writing is often idolized and um, sort of put on a pedestal as uh, synonymous with change making or even uh, the way in which, particularly with regards to climate change, maybe uh, as a writing about climate change is sort of activist in itself. Um, and there are huge problems with this, obviously, because the, the publishing industry is an industry and books are products. And, and I think there are, there are, there's a bigger conversation to have there in terms of the arts um, at large. So what I thought I'd do is just read um, part of an essay that I published uh, earlier in the year. I'm not trying to think. Yes, earlier in the year um, for a magazine called Wasafiri magazine, which is uh, about this, basically. Uh, and it's called The Books That Didn't Make Me. And it's basically a riff off The Guardian's The Books That Made Me. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit ranty. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, um, See, as a kind of provocation, I guess. And I'll just read part of it because it's it's quite long, but I'll read a part of the beginning and a part of the end. Uh, so this is the books that didn't make me a complication. The book that made me stop eating fish, or so I thought at first. It also made me think that its author would be lovely, that he would be in the flesh generous and put good things back, an easy laughter where the dead fish had been. Years later, when I interviewed said author, he attempted to guess my age on stage, unprompted. He also said that he didn't think about writing, he just wrote. It's a good thing that at this point I'd stopped eating fish for other reasons. The greater chains of carnage, a shared flat of vegetarians. Pissed off, I might have gone in search of mackerel. The book that made me come crawling back to poetry also reminds me of its slipperiness, the way that it serves. The internet punctuates itself with statements elevating poetry to the status of lifesaver, world messiah, nobility in fluorescent light. These quotes are our times embroidered prayers above the hearth. Poetry is not a luxury. In the essay of the same name, Audre Lorde makes the point that poetry is for women never an add-on, but the very breath that promises other fuller ones, less tethered ways of existence. That essay is full of poetry, but crucially, Lord's activism was in no way exclusive to her poetry. To name a few of her other endeavors, she co-founded Sisterhood in support of sisters in South Africa in solidarity with women under apartheid. She was a founding member of Women's Coalition of Saint Croix, a group in support of survivors of partner violence. She spoke at rallies for LGBTQ rights. This work isn't mentioned as often in biographical notes of Audre Lorde. Does this mean that the activism needs no clarification no life story of its own? Or is the activist in She Was a Writer and Activist assumed to operate under the umbrella of the writing? Is it by default adopted into writing's noble hereditary line? Seeing the quote made poster, made slogan for poetry as activism on a Zuckerberg owned app reminds me of why the amalgamating of literature and activism deserves my mistrust. I adore Lord's poetry for this. The books that made me stop drinking coffee for a while, but didn't make me an organizer. They caught me as a student in the west of Sweden around 2008. The climate crisis was to me itself a distant story, a chain of cries and their echoes. In Margaret Atwood's apocalyptic Madam Adam trilogy, slums built from layers of murder exist alongside her medically sealed communities, preserving privilege within. It all seemed too familiar, said the reviews. These are urgent, such flaring, stark warnings. It didn't seem familiar enough. Dystopias are hailed for their engagement with climate collapse, yet a dystopia by definition is set in the future. The genre is framed not around the here and the real, but the there and the possible, 
a suffering that is not yet palpable, meaning yet to be touched by the imagined reader who, looking up from the book, is still safe enough to look down again and keep reading. The reader who is meant to be you. Warnings necessitate the distance of foresight, the lucky stars of soon, but thank God, not yet. If not yet, then I still have time to keep reading. Do we wholly discard the writer as seer because today holds brutality enough? Consider the future as seen by some queer writers, by writers of color and disabled authors, by the many who carry historical oppression into the future as a space in which to make it explode, where explosions are possible precisely because this future has not yet been written. Consider Octavia Butler, N.K. Jemison, or River Solomon. Think of writers who say, merely by being in the future, we survived. Or turn not to the future at all, but to the ecological apocalypse on which we stand. Turn to indigenous writers. Against the racist disinterest of publishing industries, seek them out and seek beyond the readily available. Make the voices you hear too numerous to name. As for the dystopias, I don't blame those who write them. My fears guide my writing too, but here is my question. If this is future horror, what inaction is still allowed now? What waiting may still be condoned if it's not yet that bad? What I ask myself having read such books is, whose heart counts as nightmare enough to be avoided? And I'm just gonna read a part from the end. Um... Bacon built this body. <laughs> An old advert for bacon said, I used to see it on the tube in Stockholm. Really, I was built by nothing so easily packaged. I was built by my ancestors' obsessions, colonizers and colonized. I was built by my brown skin in white Scandinavia, by the contrast between my two passports, one from Viking land and one from the most dangerous country in the world. I am built by how you want me and despise me. And yes, the books complicate things. They hold a space for complications. As such, at times, they have saved me. These days, when I sit down to write, I think something along these lines. This might just build me for what I do tomorrow. Because writing is also that, not necessarily the change itself, but what fuels us in making change happen. The books that unmade me continue to pick me apart, leaving me unready for what comes next, open only to how much I'm willing to leave the page. To try and unlearn dogmas, I also go back to those books. But experience has taught us, Lord writes, that action in the now is also necessary. Without it, books are all there is. Inside these living structures defined by profit, literature that presents only harrowing futures risks becoming an excuse not to tackle present violence. Books sold as activists may offer an excuse not to change the industry that made them, an excuse to stay within the pages of the book. The books that still wanted to exist. But what else can we do as writers, the audience cries? Write and also be more than a writer. Be the human you'd like to write about. Thanks very much, Jess. Um, we've now got time for some questions. So uh, I've got some that I made earlier and we'll then have a bit of time for questions from you. So uh, I'm gonna kick things off with quite a, uh, a simple question, I think. So I think mostly we've talked so far about how our work engages with uh, climate change, but I'm interested also in, the, in how you approach the environmental sustainability of your own work. So do you think when you're creating work, what its environmental impact is going to be like and take steps to reduce or improve that? And do you have advice for people um, people like freelance creatives who are trying to work in less carbon intensive ways? You're happy to speak to that first, Lucy. Sure. Um, we try to um, look at everything we do through that lens um, from the energy we use to the energy we don't. Um, so if we take the, the our current production, Positive Imaginings, we wanted to look at the whole production. So we looked at the thing that we use most in terms of energy intensiveness, which was transport, because we work in forests. Our changing room has always been a van. 
Um, and we were like, that has to change. We're going to do it by bike. And then we thought, oh no, we live in Scotland and our production is in November. <laughs> but we did it. We did it all by bike. Um, so we had to change some things. Um, we had to, um, our criteria for employing people on the project was that they needed to like bikes <laughs> and cycling um, or be willing to get the bus and train. We did like definitely like, yeah, allow that. Um, and we had to find a local change room. So we like, would have to find a, like a community room that we could rent so that we could use that. Um, so that was the first thing. We also had to look at like costuming. So we were like, okay, we won't make any new costumes. Let's make use of what we've got and repurpose them. Um, and then um, there were lots of other things that we had to look at. Obviously the whole content of the production is about climate change, but we always feed everybody that works with us. We have we always have lunch together or a meal together, and it's a really nice way of coming together and having that shared time that's not when you're performing. Um, but we had always just like popped to the shop and bought stuff and been quite conscious and tried to, but you know, when you just pop to a shop quickly, you just buy what you can. So one of our team is brilliant. She works for the Shrub Co-op and goes around on cargo bikes collecting food from supermarkets when they're about to chuck it all out and then redistributes it. So our lunches are now part of that, which is amazing. Um, so yeah, that's just a little, a little bit. I'm happy to, yeah, chat more about um, how we do that. And, but I think it's just that, that children's fire philosophy. It's kind of every decision being able to stop and go, how does it affect this generation of children and seven to come and all children? not just humans and yeah and humans from all around the world as well and I think that's the climate just that's looking at it through a climate justice lens and I think that's we have to do that do, do we... yeah if you have something I mean I often think when for me these questions this is to close right go this way <laughs> sorry um I hope that, that almost feels like a trick question almost in a way, because I think a lot of these conversations often end up being like, okay, how can we reduce our carbon footprint and all of these operating in these categories that take us so far from, you know, looking at the root causes of all of this mess that we're in. So I think in one way, I feel like, yes, all of these kind of things that you just mentioned, like creating the spaces in the way that, you know, in line with all of these visions of the world that we're trying to bring about that is practicing that it's like this prefigurative futuring of like this is how I want to relate to others this is how I'm going to create a space that welcomes other people this is how I'm going to do relations in the space but I think for me it's much more about okay my own creative work or this this kind of research that I'm involved that is not necessarily the place to channel my rage mm -hmm. <laughs> about the world and it's much more kind of being you know, doing the politics of resisting, of, you know, of participating in direct actions, of being involved in making decisions and organizing differently. That's where I immediately go. So I'm, this is a bit of a challenge in response to the question, less of an answer, but. Uh, uh, yeah, same. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, it is really difficult because it's like, if you, if you're looking at it, um, from a very materialist point of view, like what is, is our book sustainable? Like, <laughs> like is a publishing industry sustainable? You could, you could say probably no, and definitely not that the way that it looks right now. Um, at the same time, there is also that view of like, you cannot step out of a system and operate outside of it. Like none of us can. Um, so how do you, how do you instigate change within that system and how do you kind of try and dis dismantle it? Like in one way, I'm kind of trying to like, <laughs> the way that I think about it is like, how do I challenge the conditions that made it possible for me to write this book <laughs> like, yeah. um, that, that exists there and that is kind of being traded, right? Um, so that in part, that brings me to a similar kind of conclusion as you, that I don't see my... Um, yeah, I don't see my writing as change making um, in itself, like that happens elsewhere. Um, but I think I have to write in order to like work out um, what kind of change might make sense. And and I think that's where 
yeah, that's where the role of art comes in, that it, it helps us think and it helps us figure things out um, in, alongside each other. But but it's not the it's not the change making itself. And I think there's a huge risk um, in seeing that because it can play into it can play into capitalism, basically, like quite a lot. Uh, but that's not having said, you know, to, and that's an answer to your question. At the same time, obviously, if you've just written a book about climate change and your publisher asks you, should we print tote bags, which happens, <laughs> you, you say, no, <laughs> I don't want to print tote bags. So it's like, at the same time, obviously, you're you're trying to enact that kind of... <laughs> no tote bags. <laughs> Thanks. There's some really valuable thoughts on that question, and I, I totally approve of challenging the questions as, as much of that as possible, please. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So uh, we know that the causes and impacts of climate change are highly unequal, with those who are most affected often being those who've done least to cause the problem. So, for example, I'm thinking of the recent floods in Pakistan, which were uh, widely agreed to have been made much more likely by climate change. We know that uh, based on historic emissions, Pakistan has released about a, a third as much greenhouse gas emissions as the UK has, despite being a much larger country. So I think that's quite a striking example. So we know that there's this huge inequality at the basis of both the causes of and impacts of climate change. So I just wondered if you might comment on what you think this particular injustice means for how creatives engage with climate change. I wonder if should we start from the, the other end this time? We, you happy to go first, Jess? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah so uh, I guess I've got kind of two main points on that, maybe. Uh, and one of them is around how around how climate issues are, are framed in the first place, um, because how they are framed has an impact on like what is seen to be as engaging with climate change you know just to, to take an example from like the writing world like what um a lot of the still a lot of the writing that is seen as being about climate is is also kind of um synonymous with nature writing or it's like it's put in the environmental section of bookshops or of um wherever you engage with books and that has a very apart from it being a very narrow way of looking at what the environment is, it also has a very like direct effect on who is being heard um, because, you know, majority world writers and writers of color have never written about, about nature. It's been, um, it's been as within nature in a, in a, very different way because the, there's a huge privilege to be able to write about nature rather than about the politics of environment and the way that you are shaped by your environment and the way that you are um yeah that you are but like informed by it you know a, a, a good example that i've come across lately is the it's a memoir called The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom, which is amazing. It's fantastic. Read it. Uh, but she grew up in Louisiana and it's a book uh, about, it's a memoir about the, the house in which she grew up, which was her mother's and her grandmother lived there. And that house was wiped out by Hurricane Katrina. It, the, the words climate change or climate justice are not mentioned a, a single time in the book, but obviously it's a book about environment because it's a book about poverty it's a book about racism so like how those things are framed matter hugely um and the other point which is sort of related to that is like if that is if if you don't frame discussions around climate and art as being about racism or be as being about economic inequality then again like who's going to be on your panels are you are you just going to have like art events that are primarily white or they are primarily about the future like all of those things matter hugely so i think yeah that those would be my two main points yes <laughs> to all of that <laughs> yeah yeah that is really just um yeah just very resonates with what i was thinking about when i was just 
walking uh, here that I thought it's interesting that we kind of frame this event also around like climate emergency. And it's, I think, the first thing that I thought, okay, yeah, climate emergency isn't about climate, emer like about climate, right? It's about all of these things. It's about all of these, uh, yeah, overlapping oppressions and crises uh, that are bringing about all this mess and damage into existence. Uh, and when it comes to what like art or creative practice does in that space, uh, uh, I think it's yeah, very much, I think, yeah, very similar to what you were talking about in challenging the narratives and not letting kind of a dominant, unhelpful narrative stick and making the cracks visible um, with, I think, even the climate emergency narrative is a very good example of how something that did start as a very kind of grassroots, bottom-up attempt to, to make a point, hey, everything is falling apart things need to be done uh in response to that very very quickly at a very like systems level uh and you see how now in the uk at least uh, that really has entered like mainstream politics there's lots of you know climate emergency kind of policies bills there's attempts to um do the climate citizen assemblies so kind of on that very superficial level it does look like there has been a response and the government has heard the people and the story looks nice if you look at it at that level. But if you look at the, the damage that continues, the extraction that continues, that has changed close to zero things. So I think this is where, for me, the, yeah, the, the big power of creating this yeah, art and creative work that helps us be more honest with ourselves and with one another about the the situation we're in and about the harm and about the damage and all the ways of unlearning and undoing that. I agree with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, we need to use arts. I think we need to use everything to directly address climate injustice. I think, yeah, it, it's a crime that we gloss over it and it it's still happening every day on so many different levels so um i think we need to to use the arts to start talking about it because art is a communication tool and like you said it's not necessary you know hopefully it leads to action but it's not action in itself so let's get our communication on this right and let's be truthful and i think that's where the arts have a really important role and then hopefully that leads to action that's um yeah leads to a more climate just world and I think when when we work we're not working worldwide we're working in Edinburgh so it's a very small scale it's looking at okay which which communities can we work with that perhaps don't feel like they have a voice and perhaps don't feel like they should have a voice and what are their values what's important to them so maybe that's not something in the future maybe it's the air pollution that's affecting their kids lungs right now but that's linked to climate change. That's, you know, that's a climate justice issue because the poorer neighborhoods have worse air quality in general. Um, so I think like, you know, it can be a re on a really large scale, worldwide scale, but it can be very much on a, on a small scale as well. And I think we need to, yeah, do it on all the scales. <laughs> Consider that as the most important thing. Thanks very much, everyone. Great comments there. I think that was, uh, yeah, really fantastic to hear. So we do have space now for questions from people in the room or on Zoom. So nothing from Zoom yet. Uh, if you're in the room and you would like to, yes, um, go ahead. Um, hi, um, I really kind of thinking about when you talk about burning out a year. And so I kind of, I'm studying kind of climate change finance and stuff like that. Something I've come across is basically people, um, a lot of, kind of greenwashing and whatever, and I'm just wondering in your work, how do you kind of deal, maybe even on like an emotional scale with apathy and coming against that, coming back every day to kind of think about climate crisis and engage with that and not just, you know, fall into climate despair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those online, a question there about how to avoid burnout and falling into despair if you're working on a daily basis on climate change and similarly, maybe how to avoid falling into apathy or sort of shallow greenwash kind of approaches. Uh, would anyone like to speak to that? Uh, 
maybe more on the apathy uh, part of it. Um, I think I think what helps at least me is to uh, is to introduce nuance um, into the picture because I, at some point I kind of realized, which it seems really obvious and it's probably obvious for lots of people, how how very very short the distance is between denial and like doomism. It's uh, it's essentially the same thing. Like both of them uh, remove responsibility entirely. It it means you don't have to do anything. Um, because either if things aren't that bad or they're just too bad for you to make a difference. Um, and and kind of existing in in that in between those two extremes is the difficult thing, but that's like that's where life is, <laughs> basically. Uh, so for me, and that kind of leads to the whole question of like what what is what does hope mean for me? Like what does hope mean for us individually? And I think, what one thing that's quite important that's happened uh you know we were talking about the like the climate emergency um declaration in parliament and uh the movements that came out around 2018 in this part of the world i think there was like a realization from a privileged point of view that a certain kind of hope uh was an illusion um, it was a kind of hope that was will be okay regardless, but that hope was also always very exclusive. Uh, like the majority of people in the world have never been able to kind of to rely on that kind of hope. Hope is something else. So, so for me, it's, it's about reframing that hope. It's about um, reframing it to be like there is work to do and as long as there is still work to do for me then that's what kind of drives off despair um it's not someone telling me you're going to be fine is here there's work for you to do yeah yeah i think i don't think i have an answer to a question of how to avoid burnout but perhaps uh, there is kind of a sub question in there of how do we sustain ourselves uh, and personally and one another as communities as, as human beings uh, in that and for me um i was rereading uh bell hooks uh, all about love yesterday and for me i think that's always a book that i would go to when i well very often just generally but because it's such an endless source of wisdom about life and relations with other beings and i think for me personally it's definitely the relations that i have with other humans is something that sustains me a lot and just being I guess yeah lucky enough to have a lot of love in my life uh, is something that gives me kind of I don't know some ability to go and cope with all the mess all the moment. <laughs> something like that <laughs> um yeah it's a very good question and it's one I struggle with actually um because the science is devastating and because I'm mainly working with children at the moment, I find that even more devastating, actually, because in, in terms of a climate justice lens, children haven't caused the problem. No matter how many PlayStations they want, they haven't caused this problem, the children of this world. And it's so unfair. But we've got to have hope because if children don't have hope for their future, I mean, we've really, we've completely failed. and. I know we're seeing this mental health crisis in young people and climate anxiety is, is a big part of that. And I think we have to um, focus on what we can do rather than what we can't do because we, we can only do so much as individuals. And I think that's where the collective comes into it. And I think if we um, yeah, start thinking about I have a problem with carbon footprinting for that reason it's like I've reduced this much carbon dioxide and no matter how like you you know much it is for your organization it's insignificant when you look at what's happening around the world so we just have to look at this community response and and you know community responses do work sometimes a bit too slowly but sometimes really quickly and you never know when that tipping point's going to be just like you don't know when the tipping points in climate are going to be um one's scary and one's really hopeful and i think we have to have a balance and i think nature and being in nature and remembering that we're part of it is definitely helpful in um 
feeling okay even if it's just on a kind of like a little small scale and then yeah trying to trying to keep that for the children of the world I think is really important I think we owe it to children not not to despair and not to to give up and to keep doing the work that we need to do thanks very much do we have any other questions from the floor yes go ahead So obviously one of the things that sometimes you notice know, when you get like um, environmentally friendly brands, sometimes the stuff can be a bit more pricey compared to other stuff. But right now you've got a cost of living crisis that's going on. So gas prices are going up, fuel prices are going up, electricity, all the rest of it. And if I'm going to be honest, I feel like I'm going to cost more homeless people on the streets as the years are going by. How do you, you know, how do you make environmentalism I don't mean this in a wrong way, but how do you make it relevant to people who maybe right now might have to buy stuff that, you know, might not be sustainably made, but it's cheap and they can afford it because everything else is overly expensive. How do you make that relevant? Yeah, really good question. So to, to try and summarize that for people online. You know, I think it's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, question basically stating that there are, there are other very urgent pressing issues right now, cost of living crisis, homelessness, pointing out that often uh, sustainable options tend to be more expensive and uh, something that people don't have the, the luxury of right now. So um, I suppose a question about that in general, but also how, how, how do we sustainability within this context? Yeah. Oh, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, there, there's a there's a really uh, great article uh, published in Galdem magazine the other day about um, the like cost of living crisis and the climate crisis and those movements coming together and like the moment that they do, I honestly think something really big could happen. Uh, because like they're obviously the same thing um and I, th I think the, the the main thing that we sort of have to remember is just that the same people who are making a profit from the climate crisis essentially from like the, the you know the fossil fuel industry um are also the same people who want us to think that we can solve it by individual choice um they that that falls right into their agenda to to think that we can solve this by buying the right thing um that is that is very um suitable for them um so so the farther away that we can get from that and the more we can make it as a, like this is about saving as many lives as possible and making a fair society and bringing those two together like that that's when you're actually getting to the root of what got us here in the first place um so and i think actually the changing the language around blame is a big part of that um because it's everywhere you know yeah, yeah. All of that and i think for me it it makes me almost almost like yeah angry one gets it that gets framed as a separate thing of like i've been in meetings where people would you know try to challenge what i was bringing into it by saying oh but you know this is your privileged environmental perspective or something these people are too poor to think about this like no 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 this is this is not what is happening and challenging that is so important because that allows you to see the, the, the root causes of all of these crises, you know, they all go into, you know, the, the capitalist extractive ways of relating and organizing uh, the, the world that exploits all sorts of bodies, human and not human bodies. Um, and I think for me, it's about building solidarities between ecological, feminist, uh, social justice movements and not seeing one another as like, oh, you are about women and you are about plants and you're about poor people like yeah. no 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 it's seeing like what you know who is the enemy here who we're trying to fight and kind of strengthening one another and i think there is yeah has been in scotland at least definitely some good alliances between like uh within like climate camp scotland i think there's yeah very good connection between kind of climate migration and really linking those two together and working with like very grassroots organizations and like groups in scotland that are trying to resist uh the you know existence of a grange mouth facility 
as a social and climate justice issue and it also an issue of local wealth building and all of those things uh, yeah so there's definitely sparks of those solidarities all around but yeah it's there's a lot of forces that are trying to challenge that definitely and be like no keep it separate but don't keep it separate again i agree <laughs> um yeah just one tiny thing to add is i think yeah that individual consumerism and that you can change the world by buying things is so dangerous and it's been fed by the fossil fuel industry and big businesses to make profits um and of course in theory it's better for the planet to buy an organic apple than a non-organic apple of course but it's not about that and if you look at how people spend their money and the impact they have on the environment and on society the wealthy people that make some green choices are having a far bigger environmental impact than people that are on low incomes that aren't able to make those organic apple purchases and that we have to remember that it's it's the rich that are causing this problem and the inequality that is allowed to exist in the world and in our society thank you very much i think on that note it's probably time to broaden this out into some wider discussions i see a hand from zoe is there a question from zoom if there is we'll take it yes so um in the context of exhibition design and production are the panelists able to advise on people or companies in the uk who are uh, pioneering sustainable So a question about the use of sustainable methods in things like exhibitions or theatre productions and whether people have suggestions of organisations that are doing good work. I can think of one right next to me. <laughs> we don't have any set <laughs> and we don't have any kind of design. So I suppose using the natural environment is probably the most yeah, low impact. Um, thing you can do but I can't advise on like yeah inside events because we work outside <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> sorry I'm not an expert but I do know of um, um, Akram Khan theatre company based in London who are very progressive when it comes to um, stage sets and their recent production called um, Jungle Book Reimagined has introduced some really innovative solutions to avoid freight being part of their touring and I think they're essentially um, using laser um, projections and a lot of really innovative audio to imagine stage sets and so that makes it a lot more sustainable and I think it's really useful to check the resources on their website i know um having had some um privilege to to speak to them in the past um in my previous job um that they have um implemented sustainable way of working into every stage of their um production and so that includes making things working with people um freight touring and everything else and i think it's embedded in their contracts as well so it's a really holistic approach so if anyone wants to know about the theater i would i would definitely recommend akram khan company and especially jungle book uh, reimagined is there a way that the good suggestions could be written and shared i think that's going to happen oh, be amazing. Think, um, we normally send an email round to everyone who's uh, participated in those sessions and there will be replays and suggestions also from chat so if anyone um, if it's in the Zoom room, having the conversations, please share them and we'll circulate them after the event. Okay. Yes, let's go to Jess and then I think Chris wanted to say something as well. Uh, it was just one for the recommendations thing because I realized for your question on greenwashing earlier, um, there's a brilliant book that just came out, The Value of a Whale um, by Adrian Buller, uh, which really like explained, I'm not uh, very good with economics okay? uh, in terms of and which is kind of part of the thing that we see economics as something that happens kind of up here and sort of don't get it um but it's it's brilliant and it goes back to the whole like uh seeing purchase be it individual apples or like assets as uh, something that you can keep doing and keep amassing money um in a green way 
So yeah, recommend that. I spell off my high chair. Sorry, gonna... Yes, go ahead, Chris. Um, Just adding one more to the list of sustainable theatre companies. There's a company called Pigfoot Theatre. Um, who are doing a tour called Hot and Here at the moment, which is using sustainable production and an energy generating dance floor, which sounds really fascinating. I um, can't remember what's, I think they're done in England, but um, yeah, Pigfoot Theatre, worth a look. And something else from Cara, and then we need to move on. <laughs> this is a really quick one, but for anyone in theatre, uh, reset scenery within Scotland. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, reset scenery in Scotland. Um, refurbish and repurpose and then sell on uh, theatre sets uh, so yeah and props as well I think so for anyone in theatre they're quite good to check out thanks a lot um, yeah I don't know who asked the question in zoom but um, Caro is a big expert on this stuff and is going to be joining the zoom rooms for the discussion section so you might get a chance for more of a chat about that in just a moment so um, I think you've heard enough from us on our, our high chairs. It's time to <laughs> take it down to the low chairs uh, for some group discussions. So we've got three different themes. In a moment, someone's going to come around to the different tables and put out some big sheets, which will give some discussion questions. And you're free to pick which of the themes you're most interested in. So broadly, we have a theme about collaboration, so how people working in the creative sector can work with people focused on climate change. We have a theme about sustainable practice, so how we can work uh, in environmentally sustainable ways, so kind of tying on to that last question. And then a theme about how we can engage with climate through creative work. So thinking about if you're a creative practitioner, how might your work engage with climate change in a meaningful way? If you are someone coming from a climate change background, how might you engage with creative practices and uh, work with people who are using creative approaches? So we're going to have 30 minutes discussion time. So the way this is going to work, um, you'll get to pick a table uh, with the theme that you're most interested in. There should be, if we've worked things out right, some kind of facilitator on each table who will sort of look after the discussion, um, but it's going to be very open and informal and non-structured. We just ask you to, I suppose, divide up the time this way. So kind of of the 30 minutes, spend five minutes at the start thinking about what you're doing already so kind of share examples so if you already have done an interesting collaboration share that with the group if you already are doing something sustainable with your practice share that with the group and kind of note down those things those starting points in the first five minutes and then spend the next 25 minutes thinking about what you could do next so how could you build on that um what connections are there among people on your table that might be interesting for future collaborations what are the, the barriers to sustainability in your practice that you want to overcome and devote most of the time to that. So we'll we'll give you a warning when five minutes has passed and then we'd like to move on to thinking about the future and the next steps. Uh, and then there'll be 10 minutes at the end to feedback from the group. So we'll try and get, um, hopefully there'll be time for one person from each group to come up and just share one or two of the most important things that have come up in your discussion. Does that all make sense? Great. Um, we're going to put out the big sheets now. Uh, feel free to grab uh, a tea or coffee or um, bagel if there's any left, I'm not sure. And then find the group that you're most interested in. It's free choice. Yes, go for it. And embracing more of the climate and running the issues for the viewers and last one is here. Uh, on collaboration between the sections. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, people online. I'm going to open the breakout rooms now and you can pick which breakout room you want to go into, depending on the topic. I've posted the discussion points on the chat as well, so you can take a picture of those. But the facilitators in the breakout rooms will also have those discussion points. So don't worry if you don't take a picture of them. So um, yeah, if you're online and joining us, please do um, choose whichever breakout room you'd like to go to. Thank you. Thank you.